Right, so my name is Dimitar, and I'll be speaking about architecture concept design. Uh, it's something that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, just a little bit of information about me. I'm an architect that's been using Blender since 2007. I work currently as an architectural designer at HUK in London, and I also do um, a lot of architecture education tutorials on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash uhstudio. So a little bit about my company, HOK. Uh, it's a global design firm with offices throughout US, London, Middle East, and Asia. And we mostly do large and complex projects. Uh, we're working across many typologies. So arenas, airports, churches, cultural buildings, uh, the Air and Space Museum in Washington DC, the Smithsonian is also HOK's. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And how can Blender be used within architectural design? That's a question I've been interested in probably since I started using Blender. Uh, so one of the ways that we all know is architectural visualization. These are some of my examples. You can clearly see that's not what I do all day, every day. Uh, but what I'm more interested in is Blender as a design tool. So let's take a step back. Let's look at architecture and the kind of tools that we use typically for design. So we have explicit modeling tools some of them are concept modeling tools like SketchUp and Rhino, and some of them are more production oriented like, Rhino, like Revit and Archicad. On the other hand, we have parametric modeling tools like Grasshopper, Dynamo, and also scripting uh, languages that plug in nicely with all the different packages. So the parametric tools, they talk pretty well with their explicit modeling tools counterparts. So Grasshopper with Rhino, Dynamo with Revit and so on, and Archicad with actually Grasshopper. But what I'm more interested in is this space in the middle between explicit modeling and between parametric design. How can that space be used? How can software within those sort of have the ease of use as an explicit modeling, but with some, with, with some of the inherent complexity that we get with parametric modeling tools? So as an example, here's in Rhino how we create something simple, right? We have a cube or sort of a cube, we have two lines that we start, we create a planar surface in between them, and then we extrude. The issue is, if we want to change the cube, I can turn on the vertices and move some ele elements around, but at some point I'm going to break the object, and I'm going to have to rebuild it from scratch from the bottom up. On the other hand, we have tools like Grasshopper, which allow us to be very precise, create exactly what we want, and have a lot of control trouble is, to create this really nice sketch that you see here, only in 2D, this is the amount of scripting that we need. And I consider myself a fairly advanced Grasshopper user, but it still takes a bit of time, and that's because we basically have to reinvent the wheel every time. Every operation, like offset, move, trim, is represented in one of those nodes. So, thinking about that space in between again, what, what kind of software within architectural design is there that sort of fills that nice gap between explicit and more parametric or procedural modeling. So Maya, believe it or not, is actually one that's quite used within some circles of architectural design, and he has the history, so he sort of remembers all the history, so you can modify a cube quite late into the process, even though it's one of the first operations that you've done. On the other hand, we have CATIA, which is one of the most uh, successful CAD and 3D NURBS softwares, usually used for aeronautics, aviation, uh, transportation industries, but they're investing a lot to get their architectural tool set on par. And similar like my, even though it's CAD-based, it has full history. So let's say you start with a sketch of a line. At some point, when you extrude the sketch, you offset, you pull and remove some elements, you can go back to the original sketch and remove and adjust something, and everything that follows adjusts after. Uh, we also have FreeCAD, which is an open source sort of sketching based, uh, sketch based NURBS modeler, which I'm starting to use. Uh, it also has full history. It's not as advanced as CATIA is, but it has some excellent startings, which, especially if you're an architectural designer, I recommend you try it. And then we also have Blender. So with Blender, it doesn't have history like the other tools do, at least thus far. But as we all know, and as we've seen in a series of the presentations in this conference, there's the modifier-based approach is significant. For example, if we go back to this example and try to do something similar in Blender, it's actually a piece of cake. So I start with a cube. I 
only leave one part of it. I mirror it along the x-axis, and then I rate that 120 degrees twice based on an empty. And all of a sudden, we have something in which we can only work a sixth on a sixth of the project to get something fairly complex. And then with loop cuts, we can continue to refine it later. So this approach allows us to work in architecture fairly quickly. So now I want to tell a little bit of my story. So again, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I started using a Blender when I was a student in Philadelphia. And in fact, that guy over there, let's see if this thing is working, is actually me with a bandana and long hair. Uh, but the rest of the images, they're actually from my postgraduate course in London, which is at the Architectural Association uh, Design Research Lab. And in it, it's a mostly computational design course where we get taught all kinds of different software, how to use them, Maya, uh, processing, Grasshopper, Python, uh, Java, C Sharp. We get exposed to a lot of things. It's a year and a half course, so we, although we get exposed, there isn't a lot of time to actually go in full depth without it. So what, what I particularly liked in that course was Maya. And in particular, simulations doing done with nucleus dynamics. So some of the examples, like the one in the top right-hand corner, for example, we did a lot of simulations, digital ones and then physical, and the physical ones sort of informed the materiality and something that we couldn't quite understand. But near the end of the course, I sort of stepped back a little bit and I remembered about Blender again. And what I realized is Blender can actually do subdiv modeling. You know, I knew about the concept before, but not to the level that I was taught in this program. So it's, it's hard to talk about subdiv modeling in architecture without talking about a UK-based architectural studio called Zaha Hadid Design. Those of us that model with polys and subdiv would clearly recognize some the way that some of these shapes have been formed. And if we start with something rough, we add some edge loops, and they do all theirs in Maya, and then we take it usually into Grasshopper and refine them further to allow panelization, structure, windows, penetrations to actually happen. So a friend of mine, a colleague of mine actually at work had the idea, because I do tutorials, but they're fairly simple. He said, I want to I see you do something complex. Let's see. Uh, show me your chops in a way. So I, I thought this would be a proof of concept of sort of attracting the audience that's a, that, that typically uses Maya or is interested in subdiv based architectural modeling into Blender. So this is another Zaha project that I remodeled. It's called the Grand Rabat Theater in Rabat, Morocco. And I, I got a series of reference photos. I matched some of the camera angles in my model, and then I modeled it away. So that's sort of the final result. Again, those of you that probably model cars can do this in your sleep. That's the best I can do. Uh, but in regards to uh, explaining the architecture, the curve, the sort of growth from it, from from this swing and going up and becoming the shape that it actually is, almost like a fish, I think it's done a good job. So now I want to talk a little bit about how I use Blender in the office. Uh, so I I'm lucky enough to be able to use Blender professionally alongside Rhino most of the time. Uh, so besides modeling, we do use it for representation as well. Uh, we have something that we call the Game of Joan style. One of my directors, his name is John, and we wanted to do s images like the opening sequence in Game of Thrones. Uh, probably less greedy. We didn't want to sell images to people that think they're going to go there and die. But, <laughs> but, but we think that at the same time, you know, having something that's still quite conceptual, yet it has a little bit of texture richness that adds to the image, if anything. And we think that's important to move away from these um, um, materialist hidden line renderings that we do so often. In some cases, it's, it's okay to describe diagrams, but we want to show something a bit more physical. We think of it also almost as a scale copy of a physical model. Uh, we also do normal visualizations every once in a while. This is an arena in Valencia, which is currently in the final stages of design, uh, and it's going to get built fairly soon down there. And that's uh, our view. And so these are all done with Blender. This is another arena in Barcelona that we won. And this is all done in Blender, and the models come from all different kinds of places. 
And these were actually very fun to do. Another arena, so I used to work in uh, sports and entertainment for quite a bit of time. I also do mixed use, residential, uh, done aviation projects as well. So, so these are done in Blender internal, which I thought was absolutely great for architectural diagrams. And it's a section of a arena in Yas actually currently in construction. Um, and modifiers were very useful in here. All the structure was done by a basic shape that we have the um, triangulate modifier, the wireframe, and the array modifier to get our large trusses. The, um, the auditorium, the seating actually came in from Rhino. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how I use Blender as a design tool in the office. Uh, this was a competition entry for a tram stop in the middle of a busy road in the Middle East. And it was meant to be a very sculptural object, something that you can see from quite far away. In, in, in that sense, you can sort of s understand this if you're moving fast on one side or on the other. You just want to see something kind of beautiful in sculpture, and that's sort of where the intention from the form came in. In between those two columns in the top right hand, the series of columns, that's where you have your uh, stairs that, gave, that bring you on the ground for people to actually come and experience this. So this was all modeled in Blender, subdiff, and then we 3D printed it in the office. Um, my favorite typology is theaters. And this is a theater proposal we did for a council in England. And it's a, it's a proscenium civic theater with 1,500,000 the seats. So these are the typical kinds of theaters that you would have really nice performances in. Um, uh, I love theaters because they're quite civic in nature, right? This is in the center of town. There's a, a, lo a lot of public functions in between the sort of theater space here and the public realm in this side. So in this case, the interior was modeled in Blender. A very simple subdiff modeling, yet at the same point, quite easy to get exactly what we need. Because when we design within architecture, when we move any single point, it actually has ramifications. It's similar to what was mentioned in the first day that we sort of built our own worlds, right? When we design architecture, it's very similar. We build our own world and we have to understand what those design rules are to make this a successful or unsuccessful place. In this case, the, um, the ceiling, and this is sort of a finished rendering of it from a um, different company. Uh, so the ceiling needed to perform architecturally as well. It needs to look beautiful, but it needs to be curved, uh, curved and in order for sound to not bounce too awkwardly. Uh, we, al we also have the bands on top, which are for lights to come through over here. And then we, we have to make sure that all the people that are sitting outside of the balconies, they have a good view out as well. So it's a few things to consider in something that in, in regards to modeling is fairly simple, but in regards to architecture, it is not. And I also want to mention a little bit about uh, images, finished images in architecture. Many times we don't have the time to work in-house in to create beautiful images. So we work with a lot of external companies to, to help us with the visualization. This one was done by Wire Collective. The director is actually a friend of mine who's up here as well. We met because of Blender. <laughs> uh, so to continue, this is a, a portal, an outdoor space. And the idea behind it is that we have a fixed uh, structure for events to occur but it could be open for people to pass through if you imagine that sort of blue stage there disappearing. Oh, this was completely done in Blender. Again, if you look at the trusses, they're very simple. It's a, it's a box, it's a plane with edge loops. Then we have a, a triangulate modifier, wireframe modifier, and then a ray modifier. And if you look at the series of different <coughs> structures that are happening across that top structural bit, all of them were modeled in a similar manner the light and the rig as well. So we have something fairly complex that render allows us to produce in a fairly easy manner. So this was one of those 11th hour competitions for an airport. Um, basically, the, one of the directors on the project came to me two, two hours before the project was due. <laughs> and he said, we, we're doing an airport, we need a roof. We need to come up with something. Fine, let's see what we can do here. Uh, so we started with the module, we knew what the idea was. I needed to design the module a little bit in such a way that it's, it's easy to array in both directions. So then we have a series of modifiers. We have a modifier in the X direction once, we have a mo an array modifier in the Y direction once, and then a third array modifier that brings the whole thing out. 
then that's followed by a lattice modifier that sort of picks it up. And then we have a second lattice modifier that locally deforms it, as you can see in some of those elements. And we're left with something that, again, this is done by a third visualizing company. We have something that starts to suggest architectural space and atmosphere. Um, this is a cultural master plan in a part of London where we're looking for, for suggestions to the council. It's on a site with an existing theater, and we're thinking if we make this in a, a cultural and entertainment master plan, what can we put there? So in this case, we're looking at extending the existing theater or creating a new theater and creating a black box for larger events and an existing outdoor space. Uh, all these, some of the geometry came from Rhino, some of it was modeled simply in Blender. And, you know, it's very simple. Everything is parented to the massing. So when we move something around, we just take a, a screenshot of rendering and then we have a new option about it. Also in these kinds of scenes, uh, I use particles to put people. They're quite abstract. We don't have the typical architectural detail that allows us to understand scale like doors and windows. So people help significantly. And these are used by using particles to put them in our scenes also help. Uh, this is a bit more detailed study. Um, so we do a lot of facades for our buildings as well. This is for a competition and it's a diagrid and it's using the wonderful plugin that Alessandro's been working on, Tissue. Uh, so we have a series of groups here that modify the depth of any of these triangulated panels that come out. The idea is that based on the solar studies that we're doing, some of these can be can pop up more and some of them actually blend in with the rest of the facade up higher. And here's a, a series of different tessellations, again using tissue. These were studies for a facade pattern for an arena. So we have the same base mesh in all three options in which we're just using a different panel to understand that. And this is with regular modifiers. Uh, you can imagine one of the modules, it's a rate along the x-axis, and then we use the footprint of the actual arena as the curve. We use that curve to array it, and then we have a second one which is divided by in thirds. So again, I all kinds of quick facades, especially a little bit more complex, where I, we do them in Blender because it's fairly easy. Uh, once we did a series of studies, we sort of had an idea of what we wanted to achieve. Uh, this is one of the options. So the idea is, if we have a facade that's <laughs> draped over the whole building, is there a way that we can sort of expose the important parts, reveal some of the guts? In this case, we're pinching the points of the entrance and also the concourse level, which is meant to be used public with restaurants and it's meant to be a destination on non-event days as well. So I did a series of these tests in Blender as well, where it's a very simple mesh and with soft selection and shape keys, I pick up some of the forms to look at uh, whether that's achieving something along the lines that I want. In this case, from this example, I grabbed a couple of the loop curves so you can see here, we grab the bottom, the middle, and the top curve from this previous example. And after that, I took it into Rhino, took those curves, subdivided them nicely to create a rational structure for both the, the, the long term, the, the beam spanning the long direction and the beam spanning in the short direction that we then panelize afterwards. So uh, it, to do these kinds of curves, you can do them in, in Rhino as well you probably won't get the same sort of effect because with, with, with subdivision modeling, you understand that the whole element is acting as an entity, which is something very important for preserving the co continuity of the curves. And because I'm using soft selection on a continuous mesh, it sort of adjusts what I want later down the line as well, not just the bottom curve, for example, but the middle curve in here as well. So we continue to do a series of studies for tilings. These are just done with modifiers to understand how light reflects on all of these and how smooth the gradient between something that's shaded and non-shaded is. So that I, I also continue to use in projects, unfortunately, that I cannot talk about at the moment at work. But um, my wife's not too happy that when I go home, I, I work on computers all day and then I go home and I continue to work on Blender all night as well. So this is some of my personal work. Again, uh, I, I think this understanding this sort of functionality in Blender beyond ArcVis is still in its infancy. 
and I only wish to promote that further. So in my YouTube channel, I create tutorials on how to do some simple elements. Within architecture, the pavilion is a great typology because it's fairly simple, and we use it a lot to explain either design concepts or software, like how to do things on the software side of things. So in this case, we have a simple pavilion. This is one of my first tutorials, uh, and it's created with an array modifier, with a curved modifier, it's around a curved garden in London. And then we have a couple of lattice modifiers to create something fairly rich quickly. Again, if I were to do something like this in Grasshopper, I, I would do it. It would probably be a little bit more buildable and more rationalized, but it would take probably three times as long, if not even more, to achieve. So, as I mentioned before, I love theaters. So once I understood how to do real theaters in the office, I visited a node, um, project of mine, student project, in a very tight site in Philadelphia, and I decided to see if I can redo it and sort of put um, a theater inside of it. I did quick sketches in CAD in Rhino about what the theater layouts at the different levels need to be in a section, which I then imported into Blender and used as a basis for understanding how to mass the shape. The idea behind this is that it's a it's, it's fairly large building. It sits in a fairly classical context. It's not going to look like a house because it's significantly larger. Neither sh should it look like a house, in my opinion, but those vary. But the idea is that it does have some relationship to the context. In this case, we're sort of picking up the top line, and we have a setback that happens beyond it. Doing this in Blender was very useful because it's what I call digital modeling, and not digital modeling in the sense that we literally scope with a scope brush. Digital modeling in the sense that we start with a box, we loop cut, and we pull vertices with ease that we can then apply modifiers to afterwards. And this is sort of the final result from that study as well. Um, does anybody here get a niche sometimes to do something? You know, you're really good at something, it's been a while that you've done it, and you just, you gotta do it, right? So, so this was one of these. Uh, again, at, at the university, we did a lot of uh, polygonal modeling, subdiff modeling. So I kind of understand how topology works fairly well, at least within architectural context. Uh, so this is, again, very simple. We start with a very small chunk that we array both on the X and the Y axis, then, sorry, mirror on the X and the Y axis, then we array it, and then we use a curve to deform it. And by just modifying a very small chunk, I can see the global effect as well. So it's a, it was a fairly fun project to do, which creates some sort of interesting, uh, very rich expression in regards to, to bridge. So this is a more recent project that I worked. I wanted to push tissue actually a little, a little bit more. It's a, uh, yeah, something that I'm quite interested in. So I did this quick sketch of uh, having two buildings. So it's a mixed use site, somewhere imaginary, where we have one solid site and another solid site. And then we have this sort of uh, public space, right? It's retail perhaps on the ground levels and the podium. And then the public space becomes that middle bit here, which is sort of, the, the public elements in between the buildings. So that's where you would have your lifts, you have some atriums, some sort of regular lounge spaces, sort of like if you imagine here outside, we have the stair. So that's sort of the blue part in the sketch. And uh, this was the first sort of sketch idea, and this is more of a finished element. And it, again, it's all using tissue. I'm gonna show you the base mesh initially, but I found this very kind of fun way to, to approach in some ways, computational design within architecture. And here's sort of another view. And now I want to show you some of, it's a different thing. It's going very fast. Yeah, so that's the base mesh that we started with. And then I, I think I did a subdivide and then unsubdivide to get the diagrid. So I had my diagrid panels and after I had those, then I applied my panel. And if I go back now to the presentation. And you can sort of see the effect that we have. Now this was also using vertex weights with an empty and you can sort of see where the empty was located, it's around here, and there's a sort of a spherical effect that uh, reduces the intensity of the effect afterwards. Now, I've been playing with tissue quite a bit, and I wanted to show you something else, which is a very non-standard way of using tissue, 
I'm, as an architect, I'm fascinated by urban design and I actually work on some projects in the office. Let's change this over. So this project, I think I have another video that shows it better. So this project was uh, was sort of a test to see what we can do with with um, with tissue in regards to architectural design. So this started with it was a very simple mesh that I put some vertices and subdivided, and then I went and in this case manually randomly selected elements. So we have different <coughs> materials. With those different materials afterwards, I modeled a series of simple buildings. And this is showing the modeling part. So those are sort of the final buildings, and each one of them, let's say, let's call this A, B, and C, it, re it responds to one of the colors that will go on the site. So in the end, we can get something kind of rich in a way. I mean, very simple in this sense, but it shows sort of a beginning where you can start, you know, applying tissue in ways that I didn't think it's possible. What I see is that uh, actually it's used in here three ways. So the first way is to position the actual uh, footprints of the buildings, so the plot sizes, so that's the street, some indication of lighting poles and so on. In the middle of it, you had just blank surfaces. The next way I used tissue was to create the, the tessellations on the actual buildings. So all of those are simple modules uh, that on a subdivided mesh that I just applied. And the third way was to actually position the buildings along the site. So as you saw in the previous video, we, each one of those plots was colored a different way so I can apply a different building to it. So that's just the beginning of a more sort of personal interest and exploration of how we can use Blender not only for architectural design but more in the urban design sense, which I think he has some great potentials to do. Yeah, so the next steps for me is to continue to spread the use of Blender for architectural concept design. And I'm also working on a course on Blender as well, which is very much looking at the things that I was just showing. So thanks again for checking this out. Uh, please visit me on YouTube, UH Studio. And in case you're interested in an um, architectural course, you can scan this QR code here to sign up for the mailing list. So you'll be one of the first ones to know when, when they're available. Thanks.